Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Equityverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about the S&P 500 risk metric. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. You can sign up and get access to charts like this one. You're probably familiar with the idea of a risk metric. We've talked about it with Bitcoin before, especially within the context of things like the price risk, the on-chain risk, and the social risk. You might be familiar with, with this chart here. But we can also use the same types of principles to, to navigate equities. And we've even talked about the S&P 500 risk metric before. In fact, it was back in March of 2020 that we put out a video on, on the S&P 500 risk. And the risk on it at the time was very low. In fact, back then, the risk, if you go and look at the local low here, was at 0.293, so at 0.29 risk. Now, the S&P 500 does not typically go to risk levels that are that low, okay? Going below the 0.3 risk level is not something that happens that frequently. And so when it happens, you're usually, based on historical data, you know, it's usually best um, to consider some type of, of approach of, of gaining exposure within the asset class if history is any indication. Again, it's not financial advice. But I do want to point out that the current risk on the S&P is at 0.572. Now, where have we been recently? If we zoom in to recent, you know, recent history, you'll see that the lowest we've gone was back in you know, September, October of 2022. In recent history, around that 0.36 risk level. And back in 2021, we were all the way up at around 0.8 to 0.9 risk. So pretty heated. And it showed that, look, this market was going to likely experience some headwinds because we don't often spend that much time at these extremely elevated risk levels, right? You can see that it does sometimes happen, but it, it doesn't, it, it's often not sustained for very long periods of time. Now, very long periods of time can be somewhat subjective. You know, does it mean a couple days or a few weeks? In crypto, when we're at high risk levels, we tend to only spend a few days there, maybe a few weeks tops. Within the S&P, you can spend months at high risk levels. I mean, you can spend quite a, few, quite a long period of time at those risk levels because the market can remain uh, somewhat irrational for, for long periods of time. And that's why you see, that's why you'll see the S&P 500 risk stay at a fairly high level for a longer period of time. Um, then you'll then you see then you will see with crypto. But anyways, we can see that the S and P 500 risk metric it started to diverge back in August of 2021 compared to the price. Right, so the price slowly trended just a bit higher, but the S and P started to really fall over here and go and go quite a bit lower. Now the way you navigate markets is is of course you know it, it's dependent on you right? There's no solution that's going to fit every investor. Oftentimes on Twitter, you will see people make fun or sort of criticize certain strategies that don't align with their own. But we all must remember that we're all in different phases of, of our life. Some people are willing to take on more risk. Some people are willing to take on less risk. And because of that, I think it's, it's prudent to come up with a strategy that suits you the most right? So in this case, what it would mean is identifying a risk level that you are comfortable DCAing into the market, and then identifying a risk level that you might want to DCA out of the market. Now, when it comes to crypto, I am a lot more, um, you know, I'm a lot more aggressive with DCAing out of the market at high risk levels. For instance, when Bitcoin went to the 0 0.9 to 1 risk band, Back in you know back in early 2021, that was where I mostly got out of the market. Now I did reaccumulate some back in the summer with the expectation that we would go higher. But most of the risk metrics, and we've talked about this before, right? Most of the risk metrics suggested that that you know April was the top, right? The only thing that didn't suggest that was the actual price, which again went just a bit higher in November. And at the end of the day, price action is king. Over, over all the different metrics that we use to try to identify what price is going to do. At the end of the day, price action is, is king, right? So the way, you, you know, the way that I navigate the S&P 500, again, is to, and, and any asset that I'm interested in, is to identify a risk level that whenever it's below that risk level, you ignore the news, 
right? You ignore everything and you just, you, you DCA below that risk level. Now DCA can be made more complicated or less complicated, right? If it's a static DCA, it could be putting in the same amount of money every single month, right? So maybe you put in $500 a month into the S&P 500 as long as it's below, sorry if you hear all the noise upstairs, my kids are running around, but you know, there's four of them, so what am I gonna do? If, if you have, say, um, you know, if you have a, a scenario where you say, all right, well, when it's below a certain risk level, I wanna DCA X amount, right? You could go with that strategy and say, all right, well, $500 a month if it's below, you know, let's say the 0.6 risk level, all right? But on the other hand, you could say, well, maybe if it's between 0.5 and 0.6 risk, I put in X amount. But if it's between 0.4 and 0.5, I put in 2X. If it's between you know, 0.3 and 0.4, I put in 3X, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that there's this idea of a dynamic DCA strategy, right? Where instead of a static DCA strategy where you just put in the same amount every month, with a dynamic strategy, you put in more, the lower the risk goes, right? So if the risk goes lower, then you put in more. Now, it can be difficult to navigate markets like that because it does require some type of patience. You know, being able to know that you have enough funds to put in more if the risk level were to go lower does require an element of discipline. However, during the current market conditions where interest rates are high, I would argue that it's actually easier to do that today than it has been in recent history. If you're a millennial like me, I was born in the 90s, then you are not very familiar with the risk-free rate of being, you know, where it is, right? I mean, you know, earning five, five and a half percent on, on, you know, a T-bill or a CD is something that we really haven't seen. And so if you're a person that wants to make sure you have cash to put into the market if it goes lower, you can have it in some short, short-term, you know, short-term um, assets or like, you know, short-term CDs or something like that, just to make sure you're or a money market account, just to get, you know, just to get some type of interest. And you can use that interest to DCA into the market. And if the risk level on the S&P goes to a low enough level, then at that point, if you wanted to, that you have the funds to be able to move up or, or to move in accordingly, right? Hopefully that makes sense. In fact, speaking of money market funds, this might be a good time to just take a brief detour over to the macroverse and look at funds going into retail money market, you know, or going looking at money going into the retail money market funds. And you'll see that oftentimes there will, there will be a surge in this amount or in terms of the, the money going into these funds, but it's oftentimes a recession that will turn that back around. Now, why does it turn it back around? It's not, it's not just because asset prices are lower, but also it's typically because the Fed is cutting rates to deal with their recession. So if the rates come back down, then people are gonna be less inclined to wanna put their money in fixed income investing, at least new money. Maybe if they lock some things in, they'll keep that there. But if you just have your money in, say, like a money market and you're earning 5% and you wake up one day and the Fed's cut rates and now and now you're earning th only earning 3% and you also see that asset prices are a lot lower and the, the reason they're a lot lower is because there was a recession induced by the Fed and the reason why the Fed might be cutting is to deal with the recession that they induced, then you could see asset prices lower. And if asset prices go lower, what happens is you'll see this money flow out of money market funds back into theoretically risk assets for two reasons, right? Asset prices are lower, but also the risk-free rate is lower. And if the risk-free rate is lower, then it's going to make investors want to seek yield elsewhere, okay? So that is a way that, you know, is one particular strategy that you could take on if you wanted to sort of make sure you have some money on the sidelines, there is fixed un fixed income investing, which does make some some more sense now than it really ever has, at least in in you know the investing careers of millennials. We have this you know this option now that hasn't really previously existed, and so the idea is you know just picking a risk level and saying you know what below this risk level I'll just DCA, all right, and if it goes low enough, then I will get more aggressive. Now let's take a look at some of the levels that it's gone to in the past, okay? During the financial crisis, back in 2008 and 2009, you'll see the risk went all the way down to 0.1. 
that is something that doesn't happen very often. And so if it happens, it's it's usually prudent to take advantage of it. It's like March of 2020. I mean, there weren't, re- you know, I wasn't sitting there thinking that the risk was going to go down to 0.29, right? And again, we did a video on it back then, you know, just roll back the clock a few years. It's that if it happens, then you react, right? It's more of a, rather than try to predict what's going to happen, the better idea is to react to whatever does happen. So if the risk level is at a certain level, like, you know, 0.29, like it was back in March of 2020, then it's generally a good idea to start scaling in and if you haven't already. Right? I mean, that's, of course, if you haven't already, which, I mean, again, back then, it would have been very difficult to not already scaling in at that point because um, it, it sort of just snuck up on us and the entire market collapsed very, very quickly. In 2008 and 2009, had you started to DCA in, I mean, the market would have continued to go down for a while. But again, I mean, you can see it had a pretty strong bounce. And then look what ultimately came after it. And then look at the dot-com crash. You'll see that we, we the, the risk came down to around 0.305. It bounced up and then came back down to 0.244, bounced up again, and then ultimately found its low on the risk metric at 0.220, even though the price low uh, was, was maybe just a bit lower um, a few months later. Okay, so, but what you can see is that these risk levels of, you know, below 0.3, don't really happen that often. You can see it happened in March of 2020. It happened back in 2009. And then it, it also happened back during the dot-com crash. And you can go back in history as well. Go back to the 1970s when we are in the 60s when we had periods of high inflation. And you'll find periods here where the, where the risk level went below 0.3 risk. And so that's something to consider. Okay. But, you know, you, the only way you ever take advantage of, of low risk levels and low asset prices is to always have some something set aside. And again, that something, that percentage is going to vary depending on who you are and the amount of risk you're willing to take on. Someone who doesn't want to take on a lot of risk might be sitting in more cash. Someone who does want to take on a lot of risk might not be sitting in a lot of cash and they're rewarded when markets go up. But if they take on, if, they, if they're 100% deployed, and you get some type of crash like we had in March of 2020 or in the financial crisis or the dot-com crash, and you're 100% deployed up here or up here or up here, then it doesn't give you any flexibility if the market goes down, right? And, and having some, le- some level of flexibility, I think, is useful for navigating financial markets. Now, for me personally, when the S&P does get to high risk levels, you could use it as a reason to to want to take some profits but oftentimes i mean the truth is is really the s p does just generally go up with time okay so it's not like you have to take it out at a high risk level maybe it means you just don't add as much right you or you or you just don't add anything because it's at a high high risk level or maybe if you want to buy a house you know selling it at a 0.9 risk level is a lot better than selling at a 0.5 risk level or a 0.3 risk level so that's what i've historically said over on the premium side, right, is at a high risk level for the S&P 500. It doesn't mean that you have to immediately sell, right, because we know that the risk level can stay elevated for months. But if there's a large purchase that you want to make, then certainly taking profits at, say, 0.9 risk is much more attractive than trying to take profits or trying to sell at 0.5 risk or something like that. Okay, so that's the general idea. And again, this chart is available through, um, through the website. Again, link for that is in the description below into the cryptoverse.com we do of course have several different tiers available uh, including a free one right so if you want to if you want access to the free tier we do offer a free newsletter that goes out every single most every single friday i believe and um and so do be aware that those options are there but again i would encourage you to to think of a strategy to navigate financial markets it doesn't even have to be this one right it could be some other type of metric that you create if you don't if you don't want to use this one i think that's fine it's all about how do you navigate financial markets with a plan? Okay, because if you go into financial markets with the idea that you're just going to buy when when everyone tells you not to and sell when, or sorry, if you're going to buy when everyone tells you not to and sell when, when no one wants to, right? If you go in like that, then of course it could work out. The problem is that most people, they don't wanna buy in a recession and they don't wanna sell at the height of a bull market. Okay, so you, you, you really want to have a strategy to navigate it no matter what. And the way that, you know, the way that I do it is to quantify what the risk level is. And by doing that, it, it, it better allows me um, the ability to, to navigate financial markets. And again, I mean, this is the S&P 500. There's various index funds that can track various sectors of the market. 
Um, typically, low expense ratio index funds are the way to go because they often outperform ones with larger expense ratios. It's not. It's not that. It's not that you know managers of those funds can't outperform the market ever. It's just that if and when they do, oftentimes the 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 fees that they're collecting aren't necessarily worth uh, the the incremental gain that you would have had, and it could actually lead to to a lower return than than if you had just gone with something that had like a zero percent expense ratio or something like that. So again, I mean, I I, I want to spend some time here in the equity verse so that people are aware. Of, of other strategies, other markets to navigate. Because again, at the end of the day, you know, we talk mostly about crypto. I would like to talk about other asset classes more, um, but I know my audience really likes crypto. But at the end of the day, you know, you have Bitcoin, which is extremely volatile, but you have things like Apple that are not even that far away from a new high. So some level of diversification can be a great thing for navigating financial markets. That way, if one asset class kicks the bucket and goes down 50%, then ideally your entire portfolio is not down 50% because you were somewhat diversified. Again, thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. If you're not subscribed, give the video a thumbs up. And again, check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.